So, dear guests, um, dear colleagues, friends, it's a great honor and a great delight to welcome you to this dual double lecture. I think we have never, never done that before, and this, we have had well sequences of lectures during uh, symposia and, and uh, workshops, of course. But uh, this form we have never tried out before, so it will be an experiment, but I'm sure a successful one. So we will have we will proceed so that Said starts and then we will take a very brief break, break and Wang Wei will come afterwards and then we will basically, if there are specific, very specific questions to each of the lectures, we can take them uh, at, at the moment. But otherwise we will open up them for a general discussion towards the very end of, of, the, of the exercise. Um, I will say a few words of an introductory nature about the background for, for these two lectures. Uh, and then I will say one or two words about the first speaker, Sayyid Arjumand. Um, many of you, most of you, know that the Collegium has been committed for a very long time uh, to do what it can really to promote a form of social sciences and human, social and human sciences that would be much more historical and much more global than has previously normally been the case. So the, although the Swedish Collegium for Advanced Study like a sister institute, including, when I see Carl Tam here, you have been a, visit, a guest or director at the Wissenschaftskollege, and many people here have been at other institutes, in, well, also at the Wissenschaftskolleg, actually. So you know that an institute for advanced study is basically a place where individuals can spend a wonderful time and do whatever they want, having passed through a rather stringent, st stringent examination. Helga Novotny, in a, in a lecture a couple of years ago, said that we are talking about these utopian places where you can devote yourself wholeheartedly to to research and think new thoughts, and we become, instead we are stuck with complaints about minute matters in the present day academic environments. But these places actually exist. They are called the Institutes for Advanced Study. <laughs> so let's go to them. But uh, that also means that the core of the activities each year, of course, is the cohort of fellows who are in residence. And we are extremely happy with the scholars we have <laughs> over the years. And this year is actually well, you, will, you, can, you can just come for a lunch and you will experience the lively, the vibrant atmosphere. But uh, apart from that, we have a couple of long-term engagements, and one of them is precisely this idea that we cannot just be complacent about the situation of the social and human sciences generally. And of course, sitting in this wonderful building, built in, or foundation stone laid by Gustavus III, and the first inhabitant being Carl Peter Thunberg, the only European scientist in Japan, in the 18th century, it would be very strange if we said we are completely uninterested in, in global matters, not least since we are, in my, in my view, in a situation concerning the humanities and social sciences when a number of the traditional, not only the social and human sciences, but the ordering of the universe of knowledge, we are in a situation that in many ways is not completely different from that, or at least is vaguely reminiscent, rather, of the situation in the late 18th century before there had been a consolidation and demarcation of specific scholarly disciplines. So it's a great admonition uh, being in this house to pursue research in that spirit. We shouldn't eulogize and the 18th century, of course, but, uh, and I think Marie Christine in her wonderful biography of Thürnberg precisely did not do that but we should at least think critically about not only complaining about Eurocentrism, but actually do something about it. And we have tried to do that uh, over the years. Uh, already, actually, um, in the 1990s, we pursued a research program jointly with the Max Weber colleague, our main German collab uh, collaborator at that time, was Wolfgang Schluchter, who had been for many years the Dean of Social Science at Heidelberg, and was one of the three editors of Weber's complete works, but who had also participated in the refoundation of the University of Erfurt, and as a cornerstone of that university, created something called the Max Weber Kolleg, of which Wolfgang Schluchter was the first director, and actually another uh, one of our four permanent or long-term fellows, Hans Joas, has also been holding that position. 
but it was collaboration between this German Weberian research environment and SCAS and um, the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute represented by Shmuel Eisenstadt, who I will not, I've just written a very, or no, I'm reading the proofs of a very, very long article, the introductory article of a book dedicated to the memory of Shmuel Eisenstadt, so I will not try to repeat anything. You, oh, many of you know of his works and his import, scholarly importance. But what we basically tried to do over those year, in, in those years was to engage in much more long-term studies of, great, of greater societal formations and even civilizations in the global context over vast periods of time. So in this program we, for instance, engaged in re-exploring or re-examining re the thesis of the or hypothesis of the axial age. We had many conferences in that. And we also published a much too long or a very long book, uh, which is called uh, Axis Civilizations and World History, which was, com I think, most social scientists, at least in Sweden, were completely unaware of what we were talking about. But when some years later, people like Jürgen Habermas and Charles Taylor started engaging with those issues, the interests grow, and now there are, there are major international congresses, not least the Sociological World Congresses, where the question of the axial age is a major theme. Um, in the course of this work, also in the 90s, we developed ideas of early modernities and so-called multiple modernities, and we had two special issues of the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences devoted to these issues, which were quite noted. Now, uh, we have in recent years, it pursued a program in memory of Bernhard Kahlgren, but also in memory of Schmuel Eisenstadt, the Kahlgren Eisenstadt program. And we, in the case of this, we are in a sense mainly trying to rethink global history from a non Eurocentric perspective. I mean, I wrote two long chapters for the Cambridge World History, which came out two years ago, and, and the whole oeuvre, all the volumes are, are I think, very impressive of course, excluding my small pieces, but uh, uh, it is a kind of taking report on the state of the art in thinking about history. But what we do want to do, and with we, I not, not only talk about the Collegium, but uh, one of it, well, one of its long, four long-term fellows, namely Michael Pewter sitting here, what uh, Michael and I are trying to push is that we would actually focus rather systematically on doing this rewriting from the vantage point of spaces outside of the European, the European context, not just looking at world history and making some small additions. And we have done that with, we had a, one, we had a major symposium here a couple of years ago, which was devoted to the period of the 10th to the 13th centuries, what we call the age of transregional reorientations. Of course, the starting point for most of theorizing in a Weberian spirit, but taking Europe as the, as the starting point. But we try to explore categories that would allow us to look at this comparatively, or at least engage in a conversation about what such a comparative project would in, entail. We have also had, we have also had a wonderful workshop here uh, last year, where we looked at shifting patterns of trade uh, shifting patterns of political order across all of the old and new world in the eight, 17th and 18th century. And some of you were here and participating in that, both Wang Wei and Saeed Arjuman were very active participants in that. For next year, we are going, next year we are going to go back to look at the age of what is normally called modernity. Um, uh, and we will do that from, again, a point of view which will not be solely focusing on Atlantic societies. Um, the main theme of the, of, the, of the symposium next year will be rethinking modernity, entanglements and ruptures, 1770 to, to the present. And the idea was that this year we would have a couple of interventions in the form of these lectures and conversations around them that would not set the stage. I think we're fairly, we fairly well know what we want to examine. Um, but going beyond just uh, a list of themes we want to explore and actually doing some of the exploration. And for that purpose, we are very, very happy that Said Arjumand and Wang Wei have joined us. Um, 
uh, I will not waste too much time <laughs> presenting the two speakers. I will say one or two words about Said first. Said Arjumand is, as you know, distinguished service professor of sociology at what is now Stony Brook University. It used to be the State University of New York at Stony Brook, the elite campus of, 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 SUNY, of the SUNY system. Um, he is also founder and president of the Association for the Study of Personate Societies and editor of its international journal, Journal of Personate Studies. He has been editor of many, many other things as well. You so it was, for instance, the editor of the Journal of the International Sociological Association, International Sociology. And in the handout, a few, but really just a few, of his major works are mentioned. The important early work on the shadow of God and the hidden imam, religion, political order, and societal change in Shiite Iran from the beginnings to 1890. And this is really a classic in the field and, and a book that you simply cannot avoid reading, I would say. Um, the Turban for the Crown, the Islamic Revolution in Iran, uh, of course has caused enormous, given, been given, devoted enormous attention. Your new book about the rule of law, Islam and constitutional policies in Egypt and Iran, I think has every prospect to become a modern classic. And the works you, you played, say that played a very prominent role in the international sociological and social science community. The work you did, work you did with edited work together with Elisa Pereira Reis, another very good friend of this collegium, on worlds of difference is important. And I was very happy to be able to contribute to the book, the major book you published or edited on theory and regional studies in the global age. And you've written on the Arab Revolution and the handout. It doesn't say that you've published more, much more recently also on sociology of Shia Islam and collection of essays. And I also want to mention that Said is a recurring visitor here, but he was a fellow also in 1998. It's a bit inappropriate to tell jokes or stories, but wow. I, I was at a meeting last a couple of weeks ago with the European Institutes for Advanced Study, and then I said perhaps at too late in the afternoon and being too tired so that what will people care about those hundreds and hundreds of books that have been written here? Who will remember them in a couple, of, a few hundred years? And, and said, but people might, believe, might remember that Anders Hilbo wrote some of his most important musical works here, Cold Heat and Sirens and the, the music to Gunnar Ekele's poem, Odessa Ögon and other things. And then I said, well, they may also remember that we actually, this was the place where Sitin Isham spent two years preparing the foundation for the Arab Council for the Social Sciences. Nobody knows that this happened here. It's now, I mean, this was a small little seed that was planted in this house and now has actually rather significant repercussion. And then my interlocutor, who was Nadia al-Baghdadi, who is uh, head of our sister institute at the Central European University, said, no, 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 there is another thing that is at least as important. Skas was the place where Aziz al -Asme met Said Arjumand, so the major public intellectual and social science theorist in the Persianite area and the Arab-speaking area had met here, and I couldn't but agree. But um, it's very lovely that you're here back, back here, straight from, Iran, from Tehran, actually. Welcome, sir. By looking at what's uh, special or distinctive about uh, the pattern of uh, revolution in the Islamic civilization as opposed to others. Uh, well, uh, usually when we talk about that, we, in, as with most other things, we only know one pattern, and that is the Western pattern. So I'll begin with that and then try to say why that is only one of the range of possible uh, types of revolution that could develop or could, may not in different civilizations. Tocqueville called uh, the political religion born of the French Revolution a new Islam. Um, and in a recent uh, survey of the literature on revolutions, uh, Jeff Goodwin aptly remarks that if Marxism-Leninism was the dominant revolutionary ideology of the last century, Islam may be the dominant revolutionary ideology of the present. Be that as it may, the rise of Islam, by any standards, was also an integrative a political revolution in Arabia, and as such, 
generated a distinctive pattern of revolution in world history. Now, Hannah Arndt uh, inferred that revolutions, and, are, and I quote, are the consequences, but never the causes, uh, of the downfall of political regimes, political authority. Adducing Tocqueville's observation in 1848 that the regime fell, and I quote, before rather than beneath the blows uh, of the victors, uh, who were as astonished at their, tri as, at their triumph as were the vanquished at their defeat. Now, Tocqueville's not as much as, uh, not so much as uh, mentioned in the 1979 book by Theda Scotchpole, which is supposed to have brought the state back in. Uh, but uh, for, and I, said, I would say she did it for the benefit of those who had not read uh, Tocqueville. But yet anyone who had read Tocqueville, like, like me, I think, uh, and most of you, uh, would agree that, in fact, his uh, state-centered theory of revolution remains unsurpassed. So in my forthcoming book on revolution in world history, I call the distinctive pattern found in the age of revolution in the West, that is 1789 to 1917 based. Uh, the, the, I call this Western type uh, the, uh, the, the, the Tocquevillian type, uh, which is typical of societies with centralized states. Uh, I then contrast this ideal type with three other ideal types of what I call integrative revolutions. The constitutive revolutions that create a new entity, the Aristotelian Paratian, and what will be relevant today, the Khaldunian uh, uh, type. Uh, now there in this work, of course, the rise of Islam uh, by, is typified by me as a constitutive revolution, uh, but today I wish to highlight uh, the revolutionary process uh, uniquely, uniquely distinctive of that constitutive revolution uh, and also the millennial motive that in fact sparked all my three later instances uh, of, uh, on which I am I'm, I'm basing this presentation, all of which fit the structural pattern I call the Khaldunian type. I'll come to that in just one minute. First, let me talk a little bit about the sacralization of revolutionary struggle in the path of God. By struggle, I mean jihad. That is the literal meaning of jihad, is struggle. Now, violence is endemic to segmented, stateless societies uh, of the type uh, that form the context of the rise of Islam. Uh, we have a fierce instant of such endemic violence in the first quarter of the seventh century, setting the tribes of Aus and Khazraj in violent deadlock in uh, Yasreb, later Medina or city of the prophet. Now it resulted in the invitation of Muhammad to migrate from Mecca into this, that city, uh, which was made his capital and the nucleus of growth of Islam in 622. Now from the moment creating a new uh, community in Medina, uh, Muhammad was also making provisions for revolutionary struggle or jihad, jihad in the path of God. Here's the crucial clause from the so-called Constitution of Medina, uh, the oldest document we have. Uh, it's older than many or most parts of the Quran, supposedly written very shortly after he came to Medina. He says, the covenanters, my translation, uh, shall make peace only in unity. No covenanter, uh, party to this contract, covenant, uh, shall make peace apart from the other covenanters in fighting or qital in the path of God. And the covenanters shall execute retaliation on behalf of one another with respect to the blood shed in the path of God. Now, Muhammad thus instituted a prototype of revolutionary struggle in world history as one of the pillars of Islam, as jihad indeed is. Now this autonomization of a pattern of interaction endemic to Arabian and other stateless uh, societies, uh, its autonomization, autonomization uh, into a cultural 
a norm in the Islamic civilization, a pillar of Islam, uh, was further enhanced by the second caliph, Omar, uh, the true consolidator of Islam's revolution uh, in Medina again. Uh, he sharpened the definition of the office that he had inherited uh, by assuming the military title of commander of uh, the believers, Amir al-Mu'mineen, which was first given incidentally by uh, Muhammad to uh, commanders of different raids very early, early on. Uh, now, he consonantly then uh, transformed the struggle in the path of God into an instrument of, the, of export of revolution uh, by means of integrating barely Islamicized Arab tribes. The record shows that they just came in two years before his death and they, they pulled out as soon as he died. So Omar found something useful for them uh, to do, uh, integrating them into an army of conquest and imperial uh, expansion. Uh, Omar also appointed a number of religious ideological commissars uh, to the forces exporting the revolution. They were called the Qurra, uh, or on read the, uh, readers or recitals, and recital the chapters on the spoils of war, Surat al-Anfal, uh, known also as the Jihad chapter, uh, to the troops. We do have early documentation of that. The early Medinan verses of Islam, not going to my second motive, uh, the early Medinan verses of the Quran amply uh, demonstrate the expectation of the end of time, end of the world, destruction of the world, and there can be little doubt that the millennial motives, in fact, uh, set the revolutionary struggle along the path of God. The apocalypt apocalyptic battle, or melhama, of the uh, book of I, I'll get it, of the book of Daniel, in which God sends uh, Michael and Gabriel, angels, to uh, to lead the host of angel. Uh, 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 Angel, an army of angels, is indeed uh, the uh, model for Quran's uh, apocalyptic conception of the first battle of Muhammad, the battle of Badr, in which God, in fact, does send 300 angels down. And according to the earliest uh, Muslim commentaries, uh, they are led, guess by whom? By Gabriel and Michael. Um, and according, and also, it is in the context of that precarious first Muslim victory, very precarious, that God speaks in the Quran of the ancient notion of transfer of sovereignty, translatio imperi, imperi uh, at, uh, as different nations turn in world domination or different nations turn in power. Remember, the first, fifth empire is the empire of God for Daniel, but for Christians is the empire of Christ, but the fourth are the Persian, Roman, etc. Et now, uh, this is what the Quran says. Uh, Such days uh, we turn in turns from dola, which is the word for both the state or turn in, or empire or turn in domination. Uh, we turn these uh, among peoples uh, so that God may prove uh, the believers and blot out uh, the, uh, the infidel. Now, and now let me turn uh, to, this is the precedent, of course, of Muhammad and the revolution in Arabia That's, that, of course, affects every other revolution that happens in, the, in Islamic history. And now for the Khaldunian integrative model, uh, as a model for all my, my subsequent revolutions, uh, it's basically as follows. Uh, of course, the periphery of an empire is by definition very loosely integrated, uh, politically, but, but better integrated culturally, in fact, culturally oriented uh, toward the center. And the integration that's brought about by the takeover of the center from the periphery. Aldunian revolution always starts in the desert, the periphery, they take over the center, which are the cities. Um, in fact, uh, produces a distinct type of revolution. Dynastic change is a structural precondition of this type of revolution, whose context is the integration between the urban centers and the nomadic per periphery. It involves an uh, endemic 
translocation of ruling authority and group solidarity uh, between the periphery and the center as the two components uh, of the distinctly dual uh, structure uh, of the Islamic civilization. What distinguishes mere dynastic change from revolution, however, is the superimposition of new religiously based solidarity upon existing tribal group solidarity or Asabiya, famous uh, concept of Ibn Khaldun's. Now a religious cause uh, and movement therefore need group solidarity uh, to succeed. He says prophets, religious leaders who don't know that, that are the ones who fail, the ones who do succeed precisely do know that and, and work on it. Now Ibn Khaldun thus brings a religion uh, to brings in religion to explain major cases of dynastic change which approximate our modern conception of revolution. Revolutions can be said to occur when the movement that began in the periphery conquers the center. In other words, revolution is a special case of this cyclical dynastic change, a one in which religion plays an important role. And I quote him, the uh, dynastic states with broad domination and great ruling power have their origins in religion, uh, be it either prophethood uh, or a call to God, mission, dava. Now, nevertheless, the solidarity that produces revolution is primarily tribal. Uh, this is why Ibn Khaldun very interestingly uh, refers to the rise of Islam itself as the turn in do, power, turn in world domination, or the state of the mother. Now, the mother were, tr were the, the tribal confederation that included Quraysh and, uh, uh, and Muhammad's tribe, and so he never calls it the domination of Islam. It's, it's, that's not what brought it to power. It's, it's the turn in power of a certain uh, group which included Muhammad's tribe of Quraysh, and incidentally, that's why Quraysh is so privileged in all, su all subsequent uh, uh, Islamic history. Now the victory of the rebellious uh, tribal confederates does not come suddenly and many indecisive battles take place before senil senility <coughs> takes hold of the ruling dynasty uh, resulting in the weakening of its group solidarity and the sharp decline in its fiscal power and that's where a new confederation can take it over. Now this pattern is not, conf not confined to Islamic uh, civilization. Dynastic cycles are indeed endemic to China as well, uh, fitting the rise and fall of nomadic dynastic uh, dynasties of northern China, um, and uh, indeed the Khaldunian type uh, fits what I call the Mongol Revolution, uh, or I did at the last gathering or meeting, uh, and I would say that if you replace religion by uh, political religion in the form of communism uh, and uh, communist ideology, and if you replace tribe by the party, <laughs> then I think uh, as the, the party as the solidary group that's unified on its basis, then I would claim that it fits the communist revolution in China as well. Uh, but that is, of course, not part of my, uh, part of this, this lecture. Now from our point of view though, uh, this, is, this is coming back to Islamic civilization. The Khaldunian model can explain some features of the Abbasid, uh, uh, or more accurately, the Harshamite revolution in 750, middle of mid 8th century, that's widely recognized as Islam's, uh, as Islam's social revolution. The Harshamite revolutionary agents organized a clandestine religious political movement party uh, underground on the basis of the Islamic mission with the goal of integrating inclusion of new Muslims, largely Central Asian Persian Muslims. And indeed, Khorasan was the basis uh, of its power. It did have some cells in Iraq and other places, far fewer as recent studies show. And it certainly was the Khorasanian wing of the movement from Eastern periphery of the Umayyad Empire that was decisive for the military victory of the revolution. The Khaldunian model can uh, similarly throw light uh, on certain structural features uh, of two subsequent less studied ones that I'll talk about, the Fatimid revolution 
uh, in uh, northern uh, Africa beginning 909, uh, and uh, the uh, Almohad revolution, Mahidun in the Maghreb, a century later in the 12th century. That makes it two centuries later. <laughs> now, in, in his survey, Goodwin, whom I mentioned at the beginning, also identifies one of the research frontiers for the field of study of revolution as the study of, and I quote him, cultural con contexts more conducive to collective action and revolution that, than others. Uh, he wants to bring in the culture, in other words, to explain why revolutions uh, are found in some and not in all cultures or more frequently. Now, in this presentation, in fact, I will focus on one uh, key cultural factor, namely the millennial motive, which incidentally was not favored by Ibn Khaldun. That's not his theory, it's my theory. Well, my theory was coming from now on. Or for that matter, by contemporary sociological theories of revolution. Uh, but I would want to bring this in as uh, the key element in an endemic culture of insurgency uh, in the Islamic civilization that is the background of all these others. Now, the Abbasid revolution that I just mentioned indeed did have an important apocalyptic dimension. Uh, the Alids and the Abbasid branches of the House of Muhammad vied for the leadership of the revolutionary movement uh, that overthrew the Umayyad Caliphate. Uh, and indeed, the, that movement, revolutionary movement, eventually chose the House of Abbas, uh, the less likely candidate uh, for its leadership. Uh, uh, but it should be remembered that that movement was actually called Hashemiya, named after a certain Abu Hashem, which was son of the grandson of Ali through his son Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, uh, and was the bearer of the uh, Messianic or Mahdiist tradition of the Qaysaniya, the earliest recorded uh, Messianic grouping in Islamic history. What did they say? Uh, when Muhammad ibn Hanafiya died, Ali's son, uh, fourth son, in, in the year 700, the Qaysaniya maintained that he was not dead, he was in concealment or occultation, and he would return as the Mahdi and the Qa'im. Now, at the end of, uh, uh, the end of this occultation would be the manifestation or paru parousia, zuhur, of the apocalyptic Qa'im. Now, the Qa'im is a, very, a term very hard to translate. It's the original one before the Mahdi comes into use. Uh, it has a surplus of meaning as the riser by the sword, al Ram Besaif, or riser, uh, redresser of truth, Ram al haq or more, most commonly of the rights of the house of Muhammad, Ram al-Muhammad. And now, we know from the epigraphic evidence in a mosque in San'a that the first Abbasid Caliph indeed did claim to be the Ram. Uh, apocalyptic arm. But for the Alids, of course, his rivals this, in the same revolution, the culmination of revolutionary messianic, messianism uh, came with the uprising uh, in 762, 12 years later, of Muhammad ibn Abdullah uh, al Nafsa Zakiya, meaning the pure soul, uh, exact namesake of the Prophet, as foretold in Mahdi's uh, traditions. Uh, uh, and indeed one whom the Abbasids themselves had accepted as the Mahdi of the house six years before they came to power. But then, of course, when he rose, they killed him. But uh, ex eventu, uh, certainly uh, this uh, rebellion of the pure soul contributed very richly to the Shiite apocalyptic tradition. Indeed, the killing of the pure soul is one of the signs of the hour, the end, uh, end of the world. Now, for the next hundred or so years, uh, there were several allied uprisings uh, that were millennial to varying degrees uh, uh, until the death of a childless 11th imam of the best organized Shiite sect, there were many of them, uh, the Imamiya, that happened in the year 874. Thereafter, the elders of the imami community managed to contain millennialism by making occultation indefinite, it's going to last till the end of time, don't be in a hurry, just as, and I quote, those who hold the, 
hold back the apocalypse did, according to St. Paul in early Christianity. Now, it was otherwise with the Ismaili Shia who launched their clandestine revolutionary movement uh, or mission, Dawa, uh, right at that time, last quarter of the ninth century, and whose missionaries recruited uh, among the imamis and other Shiite groups uh, in the ensuing quarter century. Now, the scholarly opinion varies on the dating of the famous Ismaili encyclopedia, uh, the ep Epistles of the Brethren of Purity, Rasail Ikhwan uh, al-Safa, and, and, uh, but I, I think that it should be dated from, I'm not the only one, of course, but, but I follow those who think that it should be dated from this period, last quarter of the ninth century. Uh, the, in fact, I would associate the epistles with a very shady, historically shady figure of Hamdan Qarmat, and the so, a brother-of-law of his who wrote a lot of books, uh, Abdan. Uh, uh, these two whose followers were known as the Qarmatis, or sometimes Karmatians in, in 19th century Orientalist writings. Now the epistle, epistles contained a revolutionary program uh, or government, and a theory of revolution, uh, both of which are framed by the latest available sciences. Uh, now, the state of the art in political science and statecraft at the time was what uh, Ibn Moskuya calls uh, the Persian and the Greek wisdom. Persian wisdom of the king of kings and the Greek wisdom uh, political philosophy. Uh, these are drawn upon uh, for framing uh, their mission a mission of divinely inspired program for government. In this frame, which is elaborated in the epistles or chapters, that's how it is, uh, devoted to political sciences, uh, the, function, the functions shared by prophecy and kingship in the Persianate wisdom, prophecy and kingship have very close uh, functions in human history, they're underlined, while philosophy is considered, and I quote, the loftiest of all preoccupations after prophecy. Uh, uh, now, prophetic politics, therefore, chapters, and kingly politics chapters are put above uh, other types in, in that encyclopedia. As a first step towards the erection of the virtuous city of God, the brethren also sanctioned a transitional uh, program for government in which reason, uh, uh, through empowerment by the lawgiver, divine lawgiver, of course, uh, can establish the position of a head and leader, Ra'is wal Imam, uh, as, uh, and, and the logic being as the maintenance of order in the affairs of religion and the world requires a head, then I quote them, we consent to a head for the society of our brethren and the arbiter among us in this is reason, uh, which God Most High has appointed head among those of his most excellent creatures. So we are guided, we're gonna have rational form of government, they say. Now the time for setting up this government of the brethren of purity, uh, who also call themselves uh, people of justice, Ahl al-Adl, uh, was a tent. God had said such, and I quoted this before, such days we turn out amongst the people. And uh, it was this millennial moment of uh, translatio imperi, uh, the transfer of divinely ordained sovereignty uh, from, one, uh, one, from one people to another people uh, that was at hand. Thus is cast the verdict of our time uh, of the turn in power or state of the people of the good. That's themselves. Now the brethren also elaborated theory of revolution uh, as the millennial movement moment of this transfer of so sovereignty. This, this period was already, uh, this theory was already current and in fact it had been applied to the Abbasid revolution and I quote, as a total revolution in religion and the state. In the chapters on revolution and cycles in the epistles, we read that the 
inauspicious conjunction of stars result, and I quote, in corruption of the times, departure of people from moderation, cessation of uh, revelation, uh, the art of the, 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 of the learned, tyranny of kings, corruption of people's morals, and destruction of cities and provinces, end quote. Now, changing in sovereignty of the uh, dynastic houses, Ahlabayt, and civil wars occur at the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter every 20 years. Then changes in world domination from one nation to another at the shift from one triplicity to another of this conjunction every 240 years. And the greatest revolution of all, of course, changes in religion uh, by the prophet lawgivers occurs every 60, 960 lunar years. It's 160 solar years, which would be a lunar millennium, if you convert that. Uh, there is your millennialism. Uh, so every uh, lunar millennium at the conjunction of the Saturn and Jupiter, at the shift back to the initial triplicity of the signs of fire. I hope you understand what that is, but, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm just reporting. Now, the, the term climb then, is taken the apocalyptic regressor at the end of time, is, is, is given a new meaning in this astrological theory of history. Uh, each 120-year cycle is inaugurated by Ram, uh, who is followed by six imams. The seventh imam, who completes the heptad, uh, is the Ram of the next cycle. The Ram of resurrection, the last one, final one, it would be expected at the end of the millennium of Muhammad, uh, which is the final millennium. This is their theory of revolution. This cogent theory, uh, as well as more concrete plans I mentioned uh, for a revolution of the intellectuals, and that's what they were, They're, this encyclopedia is, is a very impressive uh, 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 report of all available sciences in addition to their own creed. Uh, sadly, this this revolution of the intellectuals sad, sadly funded on the weakness of the urban strata uh, in the heartland of the Abbasid Caliphate uh, and fell on deaf ears of the Bedouins, Bedouin in the surrounding desert. Debilitated as it was by internal dissension, ascendancy of uh, slave uh, palace guards and other factors, uh, the Caliphal state uh, nevertheless managed to suppress the revolutionary movement of the Ismailis and to push it uh, underground in the cities. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I would say that the ideational embers whose sparks were to ignite later uh, fires of millennial revolt were indeed buried in the ashes of the extinguished rebellion uh, in the heartland. But the story was otherwise as many of the Ismailis uh, realized that, quickly learned their lesson and said, we have to get, get away from, we're too close to government. Let, let's, let's go as far as we can into the desert, find some tribes and convert them. And so my next section is about the imposters, nomads, charisma of lineage and messianism in the making of the next, my next revolution, Fatimid revolution, which is the same one. The revolution was not made by the intellectual. It was made by, uh, by these imposters and uh, going out there. Who are my compatriots? They're all Persians, actually, <laughs> to tell you the truth, going all the way down to the end of Marrakesh, to the corner of black Africa to stay out of the <laughs> trouble of central government, then coming back here. Now, there was at least one rival center to that of the Karmatis that I mentioned. It had moved from southern Iran and Iraq to Salamia in the, uh, Syria under a certain Abu Shalaklaq, uh, who claimed uh, to be, of course, he was from northern Iran, uh, whatever this weird uh, 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 nickname meant, uh, who had claimed to be the proof or hujja of the hidden imam. Now, each of his missionaries, in fact, was said to be in charge of an island or a jazeera and would establish a community, organize an abode of migration, Dar al-Hijra, on the model of Muhammad uh, when he moved from Mecca to Medina. Uh, 
Now, around late in 1890s, 890s, last end of the ninth century, shortly before his death, this proof in Salamia, uh, in fact, uh, had, he had no male offspring. Uh, in fact, he decided to split this mythical uh, seventh uh, Imam Mahdi Qa'im, who were, su were supposed to be the same person in occultation, he decided to split that into its three component parts, claiming the imamate for himself and designating his nephew as the Mahdi and the latter's young son as the Qa'im. This is unusual. It didn't happen with any other movement. This nephew, Saeed ibn al Hussein, uh, was, renamed himself Abu Muhammad Abdullah, assuming the title of Al Mahdi Allah. That's also a slightly unusual title, rightly guided by God. That's Mahdi means rightly guided. And then his infant son was named just like Muhammad. He's named Abu Ghas, Abu Ghasim Muhammad styling himself Al-Qa'im, the Amrallah, riser by God's command. Now, one of Abu Shalaklah's Persian missionaries, in fact, proselytized among the nomads of Iraq and Syria with two of his sons who claimed uh, messianic apocalyptic titles uh, for themselves. Uh, they didn't succeed. Uh, meanwhile, this uh, second generation, uh, Said from uh, northern Iran, uh, alias Abu Muhammad Abdullah uh, could not remain in Syria. He had to run away uh, and taking his son along as the Qa'im, the apocalyptic expected uh, savior along with him, he began a decade-long peregrination uh, through Egypt, uh, Ifriqiya, North Africa, that Tunisia, uh, Libya, etc., all the way down to the extreme end of the Maghreb, that is uh, uh, Masa, uh, right uh, very, as close as you can get to black Africa, really the end of the Muslim world at the time. Now when he went there, he took along books of uh, political astrology with him, uh, with the prediction of the year for the conjunction of the Saturn of Jupiter, uh, in the year 296-9089. This conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, in fact, uh, was precisely the time when one of the missionary in Ephrygia, uh, I think um, in Tunisia, uh, present day, uh, uh, the Ismaili missionary Abu Abdullah Hashi, uh, in fact, set up uh, the Fatimid state uh, for the Mahdi to, to arrive, uh, to appear uh, in 909. Meanwhile, something else was happening. They came west, as far west as they could go to the periphery. Other people went eastward, other Ismaili missions. In the 890s, the Qarmati Center had sent a Persian missionary, Abu Said, at Jannabi to Bahrain, and an Iraqi missionary, Ibn, Ibn Hoshab, to the Yemen to proselytize among the Bedouin. And now the revolution succeeded permanently in Bahrain, creating the Qarmati state. Abu Said and his uh, son Abu Tahir after him ruled it completely independently of the movement and claimed to be Qa'im Mahdi's themselves. The success of the revolution in the Yemen lasted only till 915 after both Ibn Hoshab and the defecting missionary who had claimed Qa'am uh, Mahdihud for himself had died a few months apart. But the success, the lasting success, was of course in North Africa, in Ifriqiya. The success of Fatimid revolution in Ifriqiya in 1909, 909, I'm sorry, was entirely due to a decade of very hard and arduous proselytizing among the Kotama nomads by the missionary Abu Abdullah Hashi. Uh, he had never met the father and son impostors uh, who had fled Salamia to the extreme southwest of the Maghreb uh, and who were be to become the first and second Fatimid caliphs with the titles Al-Mahdi and Al-Qa'im respectively. In 910, however, Abu Abdullah Hashi, she went and fetched the Mahdi and established him on the throne 
but he was killed by this Mahdi or Said or whatever his name was uh, exactly a year later uh, before and then he took over, uh, the Mahdi took over uh, and with Abu Abdullah Hashi perished his brother and counselor Abu Abbas who belonged to the circle of revolutionary, Iraqi revolutionary intellectuals who had written the epistles of the Brethren of Purity. Uh, what, when that happened, after the Kotama tribal chiefs very quickly came to dominate the new regime in Ephrygia without the disciplining control of this austere missionary who had converted them, who kept, in fact, uh, managed to maintain uh, good discipline for at least a year while he was around, but then, uh, then they took over completely. Now, as the heir apparent to the Mahdi, the Ghaim, in fact, made two unsuccessful attempts to conquer Egypt, but then disappeared from the public scene completely once he became the caliph himself. Nobody saw him much. Uh, the, so the success, in fact, this success of the Persian impostors in eliminating both the spiritual ideological leader uh, of the movement, of the Ismaili movement, and in establishing a dynasty for themselves in North Africa, uh, that by itself would not have justified calling the event a revolution. Indeed, the new regime only survived the extensive Kharijite uh, rebellion at the time of al Qam's death in 944, purely by chance probably, and through the, or well, not purely by chance, but uh, chance and through the valor uh, and military success uh, of his undesignated uh, successor who, however, once he put down the rebellion, then assumed the apocalyptic regnal title of Al-Mansur. It was only after the re reconstruction of the historical memory of the episode as the defeat of the Kharijite Antichrist, Dajjal, by the divinely sustained Mansur, only after that, that the great uh, Ismaili theorist and ideologue, uh, Qadi al-Nu'man, in fact, could rekindle the millennial, millennial impulse and harness it to the conquest of Egypt in 969, 60 years later, uh, the, after, the, after the founding of the Caliphate. Now, under his master, Noman's master, the Qadi Noman's master, uh, that is the Fatimid Caliph al Mu'ez, then a dual structure, a dual regime of state, mission, dola, da'wa, was set up committed to the export of the Ismaili revolution for the next century. A century is a long time. They just went on for 100 years with their very elaborate propaganda. It was the Fatimid, it was the Ismaili international like the, uh, the <laughs> our 20th century international that we know much better. Now the Fatimid state then vigorously promoted the revolutionary technique of assassination some 900 years before the European uh, anarchists and the Russian anarchists, especially indeed the word assassin, hashishin, is, 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 comes from there. Uh, like people say about the suicide bombers now, they said that this old man in the mountain takes them up there, gives them hashish, they said, uh, says you're in, in paradise, go and kill this uh, vizier of the Seljuk Sultan and you'll come right back up here and he would just go and do it because he was, uh, uh, he smoked uh, pot and hashish and he was high and so forth and he thought he would go back to paradise. Anyway, uh, now this, uh, the, of course, and the, the, the organization is superb. Their propaganda thing, they would send missionaries, they would, they would pen, send pamphlets, everything for 100 years. Nevertheless, the millennial Im impulse inevitably dulled uh, by a century of bureaucratization of propaganda. Uh, it was rekindled at the end of the 11th century as the new mission, the Abat jadid in the Ismaili fortresses in the uh, mountains of northern Iran, and a couple in Lebanon too. The old man of the mountain actually who gave the hashish was in Lebanon. Uh, it was revived by Hassan Sabah, who died in 1126, and it culminated 40 years after Hassan's death in the declaration, indeed, of the great resurrection, 
and abolition of the Sharia of Muhammad in, uh, by Hassan II in 1166. They lived beyond the law, did anything they liked for another 100 years up in the mountains until the Mongols came and put an end to their rule. So let me finally turn to the revolution that impressed uh, Ibn Khaldun so much at the beginning of the Muqaddama uh, that uh, he, his theory uh, was based on it, that of, and I quote Ibn Khaldun, the rightly guided Imam and leader of Al-Muhad's turn in power. Imam al-Mahdi, Sahab al-Dawla, turn in power, al-Muahidun, the, the, the monotheists, the, the monists, the Unitarians. Now to overthrow his enemies, Ibn Khaldun says, he called his people to their uh, holy struggle, jihad, by himself, and he extirpated the state, uh, Dawla, from its basis, turning it upside down by making its highest classes the lowest revolution. Now, the partisanship that gave effect to Mahdi ibn Tumart's uh, mission uh, is explained somewhat later. The Lamtuna or al Muravid uh, for us uh, kings, uh, Lamtuna was their tribal name, uh, had come to power a century earlier through the Sanhaja uh, tribes uh, in the Maghreb, uh, incidentally in what was a, a dress rehearsal for, and by another Berber, for Mahdi ibn Tumart, a man called Abdullah ibn Yasin, who, uh, who, who carried out a similar revolution. But then he says their tribal solidarity and partisan, or partisanship, Asabiya, eroded until God allowed the extension of the, uh, the, the state uh, and then the Almohads, Mahedun, came to efface its vestiges. They did so, Ibn Khaldun says, with the force of the tribal sol solidarity, partisanship of the Masmuda. So the Masmuda tribe confederation replaces the Sanhaja. For the earlier Fatimids, it had been the, uh, uh, the Kotama tribe, so, so tribal confederation. Uh, that, all these fit Ibn Khaldun's theory perfectly. But now for my, my millenarian bit added to it, the Fatimid uh, Shiite idea of apocalyptic leadership or imamat of the Mahdi uh, as, uh, had in fact uh, survived the collapse of the Fatimid Empire in the Maghreb. It was appropriated by two indigenous climates, uh, climates in the first uh, half of the 20th century. One in Andalusia, the Sufi Ibn Ghassi, exact contemporary, uh, contemporary of him, and the second, our subject, the Berber uh, Ibn Tumart in the southern frontier of Islam uh, in the Maghreb, way beyond, beyond the Atlas Mountains, as far as you could go down. Now, Ibn Tumart's jihad, in fact, quickly, I would say, Ibn Tumart's jihad state sustained a primitive structure. Uh, he carried it on for, for uh, a decade, and it expanded rapidly in 1120s, reaching the region surrounding Marrakesh by 1130. The Almohad uh, holy warriors confronted the government forces outside of Marrakesh, but were defeated in 1130. The withdrawal of divine backing, uh, indicated by this defeat, of course, made the Mahdi very uh, Mahdi ill, he died childless a few months later. But nevertheless, before he died, he rode his donkey. Uh, we know who else rode uh, the donkey to Jerusalem. Actually, there are several uh, Muslims who did follow Christ in that, uh, to, to, to deliver the last sermon to his followers, uh, promising that they would conquer, and I quote, Persia and the Christian lands, as predicted uh, as signs of the end of time. Now, Ibn Tumart was an original and fundamentalist thinker who advocated the return to the Quran and the Hadith as the fundamentals of Islam, uh, alongside with the credo of uh, monotheism, aqidat al-Tawheed, unity of God. Uh, and that on the basis of reason or rational understanding of its principles. Indeed, sources contemporary to al mahads acknowledge that Ibn Tumart initiated a a rational school of thought, mashab uh, fiqh, fiqh, mashab fiqh, rational thought of re school of reason. Now, 
Abdul Mamen, the true consolidator uh, of the Almohad revolution, established the Berber monarchy in his own dynasty by the mid-century, uh, while at the same time developing distinctive Almohad institutions. He transferred the College of Hofaz, originally meant memorizers of Ibn Tumart's uh, 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 creed. Incidentally, he was eloquent in Berber too, uh, as well as Arabic. Uh, it didn't make it stick, but, but a lot of the propagandist was done in, in Berber uh, and not in Arabic. Uh, in Marrakesh, uh, into a school for training administrat administrative cadre of the Almohad uh, Empire. The college in Marrakesh at the same time uh, trained the cadre of these ideological commissars, the so-called Tullab Talaba uh, student militants, uh, to supervise and organize those uh, uh, commissars in the provincial cities and tribal areas. The highest level of these uh, students actually was transformed, the so-called uh, people of the court, the Talaba of court, uh, uh, in fact, was instituted under, by Mahdi himself, but underwent a different uh, institutional uh, transformation to become a sort of a royal academy when the monarchy was established by Abdul Momen in the Momeni dynasty. Uh, that is the uh, intellectual elite of the Momeni dynasty uh, and advi as advisors to the caliph um, gathered there. After the conquest of Andalusia, Abdel Momen, in fact, uh, uh, Andalusia, uh, he, he took an interest in the intellectual debates in, of this uh, Royal Academy and frequented, uh, frequented the uh, philosopher Abu Bakr ibn Tufail, uh, who in fact became physician of his, an advisor of his son Abu Yaqub Yusuf. Ibn Tufail, uh, arranged a private meeting early between Abu Yaqub and introduced to him a young philosopher capable of disseminating the philosophy of Aristotle, uh, namely Abu walid Muhammad ibn Rushd, known to the Latins as Averroes. Uh, Abu Yaqub Yusuf commissioned ibn Rushd to write commentaries uh, on the works of Aristotle. Averroes replaced the primitive rationalism of the Ash'arite theology of Azali, which was really Ibn Tumart's uh, mentor, uh, with his own advanced argument, which was the following, that rational demonstration through logic in philosophy, on the one hand, and persuasion through rhetoric in allegorical interpretation, which is done in religion, through prophets and first through philosophers. These were alternative methods for reaching truth. His argument uh, then, namely that the study of the books of the ancients is obligatory, incumbent by the Sharia, by God's law, because they open, and I quote, the door of theoretical study, which leads to the true knowledge of him, God. Now, this argument, I would say, was certainly consistent with Ibn Tumart's uh, teaching that the principles of religion could only be understood by rational proof. Now, the Mohammedan caliphs uh, never disbanded the distinctive institutions of al muhad hierarchy uh, and, in fact, the, its doctrinal ideological state. Their Berber patrimonial monarchy, in fact, coexisted with the Almohad hierar uh, hierarchy, resulting in the regime's distinct uh, dual uh, structure of power that lasted for a, a good century uh, after, after Abdul Mohammed. Now, Ibn Tumart's Berber revolution uh, was of the greatest importance, of course, for the deepening and Islamicization of the Berber uh, tribes uh, throughout. In North Africa because he conquered Afriqiya as well and uh, Spain. Uh, but its most important consequence in world history, I would say, was the rehabilitation of Greek philosophy in general and of Aristotle in particular for the Islamic civilization. The rehab rehabilitation of philosophy and rational sciences uh, after it had been very severely debilitated by uh, by Ibn Tumart's intellectual 
hero, Al-Ghazali, it was indeed Ibn Rushd's greatest achievement, uh, and I've argued that it should be considered the long-term consequence of the Almohad revolution. If Ibn Tumar's creed was rightly considered the foundation of a school of uh, thought, mass of fiqh, as I said, then Ibn Rushd's philosophy would indeed be its culmination. Uh, though the, through the latter, the heritage of Aristotle was transmitted to Western Europe, and the Latin Averroists uh, dominated the University of Paris within a generation, uh, paving the way for one of the Dominican professors of that uh, university, Thomas Aquinas, uh, to commission the, remain the, the, the translation of uh, the last uh, remaining works of Aristotle, really most notably Politics, which was the one major book that had never been translated into Arabic. And you know the rest of the story. Now, sociologically, I would say, one can explain the success of Averroes' philosophy in Paris, and hence the West, at least partially, of course, in sociological factors. In sociological, one can explain this by its transplant, transplantation into a world region where cities were surrounded by settled uh, rural uh, populations as compared to Ebn Rushd's own transplantation from Seville in the more uh, urbanized Andalusia uh, to Marrakesh, which was surrounded by a nomadic population and where his books uh, were burned in his last year and indeed the caliph was forced to withdraw his protection uh, that was restored only a few months before Ibn Rush's death in 1198. Now the pattern I claim to be distinctive of revolution in the Islamic society is replicated with great success in the rise of the Safavid Empire in Iran at the beginning and elsewhere in the beginning of the 16th century. And also in the eventual failure, eventually failed, uh, uh, failure of the Roshani movement among the nomadic tribes of the northwestern uh, frontier region of India later that century. Uh, when it recurs in the Babi uprising in 1848 in Iran, uh, then uh, one of the crucial elements is missing. That is the nomadic tribes. They're not there. Now, therefore, I'd say that just to conclude that as a millennial revolution among a settled population, the Bobby uprising invites comparison with the other non-European revolution of 1848, namely the Taiping. Uh, thank you for your patience. <laughs>